In this lecture, it's going to cover programming languages, but more specifically how programming languages are specified. The learning objective specifically is to understand what are specifications and understand that there are going to be different kinds of documentation related to technical information. All right. But we're going to focus on one in particular in this lecture called a BNF. Um, but I'm going to allude to the fact that there are other kinds of documentations. Um, the role of being specific is really important in programming in any kind of technical work. Being specific is really good because you can reduce errors in your communication. And so there's less chance of miscommunication. Um, one of the points I wanted to demonstrate through this lecture is to show that there's different programming languages and because there's different authors behind these languages and different authors writing the documentation that every specifications document is going to be slightly unique even if they, they might share similar purpose um, or similar ideas it may be expressed slightly differently. And so because there is no two documents exactly identically the same as each other in this world, then um, the final point I wanted to make is that there is an art to technical writing. Um, before today, you probably have heard many times you should write comments with your code, you should document things, you should write things down. All of that still applies here. I think the more that you see how um, how your role in reading documentation is affected by the authorship of the person writing it, I think the more you'll be able to get a sense of how you should do it and produce better writing. Alright, so let's begin. Um, so today, this talk, it's going to be focused more on programming language as like the case study for being specific. I'm going to go into some general examples to show how even outside of programming it's really important to be specific and use specification. So before going into general examples though, I just want to set the tone that we are going to talk about programming and that if you look at all the different aspects of a programming language, it's not just the language itself, but also the documentation surrounding it. The features of the language are documented, and then there's the uh, development tools on the machine on different operating systems to be able to run that program and compile it if needed. And then there's the community and the people involved. So um, in order for people to be able to express to each other parts of a programming language, um, whether it's written or verbally uh, through conversations, you need some way to be able to talk about the common things and to you know pinpoint exactly what you're talking about. So that's what I wanted to start with here in this lecture to talk about what is being specific, why does it even matter? So what is this being specific? What is this all about? Okay, um, this image on the slide I found years ago came across it and I thought it was hilarious. It was showing how there's two different people, uh, two different kinds of groups of people in this world when they refer to color names. On one side, on the left, you'll see there's a name for each color shade. On the right, you'll see that a few different together are a color. All right, so you've got some people who are more precise in how they name colors and then others who just say eh, it's you know it's a blue there's um, in this world there's like a wide range spectrum of people who are either very precise or not not as precise when they're speaking right there are pros and cons to each and I'm not saying that there's a better or worse um, in terms of your personal preference however if you were to work on a technical project and speak about technical topics with somebody else, the more precise and granular you can get with your communication, the more precise you are 
And so that's like highly valued. You know, you don't want to just say number. If you're talking about programming, you want to say, is it a decimal number or a whole number, right? So that's, that's an example. All right, so let's go into general examples because, um, you know, programming is what we're always talking about in computer science, but I think you should also see how other industries and other, you know, people out there besides programmers are also using specifications. They may not use it in the same vocabulary we do, um, but it, it's, you know, very important to be able to be precise for a lot of various functions. The first one I want to start with, uh, because I think it's very, like, common um, and something you may have been exposed to in your own life, and that is um, the correct shoe size. Um, I was trying to research to find out what kind of devices are available to accurately measure feet size. And I found that the first measurement device that was mainstream around this country is this one that's pictured on the slide called a Branoff, uh, Branoff device. It was patented in 1927. Sorry, 19, yeah, 1927, I did say that right. And uh, the patent itself, the document, is on, um, on this website. So you can see specifically what that person uh, who invented it, how they were very specific in describing the item that they invented. Um, long story short here, because the point that I wanted to make is that we have one device created almost 100 years ago, and it's still being used in most shoe stores these days. And if you look at it and think about like how accurate it can get, it is only looking at the length of the foot from the heel to the toe and then also the width. Now shoe manufacturers tend to manufacture shoes of only like usual like average width. Sometimes you'll see wider or narrower, but you know, manufacturers have to, um, have to produce shoes to a certain size and then people who want to buy shoes have to look at that size chart to be able to figure out what they're going to buy. Um, and the other thing that I found interesting while I was doing the research to figure out the stuff for this one slide is that people have different uh, feet sizes, meaning there's like, I think 30 or 40% of the world where their left foot might be larger than the right or the right foot's larger than the left, you know? It's so it's like more than what this measuring device would call half a size. And I think that would that would be like at least half an inch different. So there's a lot of people with asymmetrical feet sizes. And so the way they would handle it, you know, because the manufacturers are going to create um, and produce shoes of the same size where they assume the customer has symmetrical sized feet and then the customer has to be the one to manage their different feet sizes by buying two different sizes and then you know returning the two that don't fit if the retailer accepts that or if the manufacturer accepts that so you could see how like even just standardizing something as simple as we see everyday shoes there's a lot of effort and work going on behind the scenes. And you do have the size chart to be able to reference from both the manufacturer standpoint and the retailer and the customer. Um, since 1927, we have seen a lot of new technology. So there are some places where you can get custom sized shoes. It's not going to be affordable for a lot of us. It's going to be requiring a little bit more um, heftier of a price tag to be able to uh, get this product, um, I'm sorry, the service, to be able to uh, get perfectly fitting shoes. Now, um, I had said maybe 30 or 40 percent of people had different shoe sizes and now I see that I did make a note here that it's 60 percent of people uh, around the world based on the, um, the link here, 
um, it says that oops, so I want to go there it says that there's different sized feet there we go um, so there's 80% of people the bigger foot is the left of that 60% population and um, you know the other 20% would be right foot larger than left and that would be 20% of the 60% of the overall population. I don't know where they got these figures specifically but it's something to think about right like people have the unique different needs they have different arch shapes they may have different toe shapes um, and then some other like pronation possibly so something like Nike fit is designed to be able to provide a very custom fit for the customer um, so there there are you know techniques to help overcome some of these challenges but in order to mass produce we just need something simple and so we have a size chart developed through this uh, device that captured the width and the length of feet and then based on the probability and distribution of feet, um, you know of whenever they collected the data and analyzed it that's what they were able to end up with the next point I want to make is that when you have something so specific it doesn't necessarily have to be numbers only it could also be uh, graphically pictured and so you, you'll see this with like IKEA manuals you if you were a customer like I'm sorry uh, let me put it this way if you bought something from IKEA um, and you wanted to put it together you're gonna assume that all the parts are you know packaged in that box all the parts that you need are in there and you're going to assume that the manual is going to help you quickly figure out how to put it together and it'll just say this piece and that piece with these little fastening um, screws, bolts and whatever. So you can convey your information, you know, if you're the developer or manufacturer, you can convey the information to your customer through a lot of different ways. You can have um, the text, you can have uh, pictures. I think videos might also be possible, like some manufacturers do have videos teaching you how to use their products online. Whatever it might be, these are all different ways to be able to convey information. So you, now you can see specifications, it not only has to be precise, but it has to somehow convey meaningful information. IKEA manuals in particular tend to describe the tools that you might need the parts that should have come with the box, and then the order to uh, construct the furniture item. So all of that's just to be able to communicate. And finally, you might see bits and pieces, you know, at the end of documentation that would say, if you still need more support on figuring this out, then, you know, this is how you can contact us. And just to tie in the graphical type of manual and like documentation to um, what we're doing with computer science, I found a website, ideainstructions.com, um, that had a lot of different images to depict commonly seen concepts from CS. So for instance, here we have binary search. If you recall the, <coughs> if you recall this from your data structures class, it is a pro, uh, sorry, it's, it's a problem solving technique where you take a problem space and you try to find out which half or you divide the problem half in, in uh, problem space in half. Okay, you divide that space in half and then you decide which of that half to discard. So you discard one half, so you're left with half. And you continue that practice to keep dividing in half and throwing away half. So you just continue this sort of, um, you know, iteration through 
until the end. And you've probably seen in your 3130 class that this could be written in pseudocode. It could be written in code. It could be written down just as like a, a little outline for yourself. And now you can see it can also be displayed in a graphical way where you could um, see how you've got a large problem space, you've got a certain item that you're looking for, and you don't want to randomly choose, but instead figure out what's in the middle, check that value, then weigh the left and right sides. Okay. Moving on um, to more of like the, the whole aspect of using programming language as a way to build things. So now the examples are a little bit more of that nature. Um, in design, graphic design in particular, you may see images like this that talk about typography. And this I wanted to show that in order for graphic designers to talk about font faces and the uh, different size and shapes, they have to get very precise about a lot of things. So there's a lot of vocabulary here to describe different characteristics of fonts. Typefaces is maybe what they call it. So that's the point of this slide, just to, to show that in order to be very precise, you then have to have really specific measurements that you could uh, talk about and then adjust on those measurements, right? So going back to shoes and measuring, like that's what we do a lot of um, here. Um, and then in general in, in engineering, okay? Units of measurements have to be precise. Moving on to a construction example, uh, this goes back to what we might have seen as kids. You know, we might have had a toy where we take shapes, uh, primary shapes, basic shapes, and then put them in the correct slot. So the idea of being able to recognize different shapes and be able to get the placement correct to, to get the right fit is really important. Okay, as kids, we learn the really basic version, but as adults, we learn more and more specific, specialized problem spaces. So then we end up looking at even more and more detail. And we use specifications, you know, the type of document specifications to reference for various problems. Now, I brought up some examples of uh, screws here at the bottom of the slide to show that even in construction, they get really precise about a little item that they work with. And um, if you've ever done any type of, uh, you know, hanging a picture on the wall, putting up curtains or whatever it might be, that you're going to have to decide if you're working with a screwdriver or a Phillips head screwdriver. What's the difference? One's across and one's just a line. Um, you also have to figure out if you've got the right size of things, you know, like does the screw fit in the hole that you're working with? Are you getting a drill bit that's the right size? And so on. But you might be wondering, like, how do you even know what's the right size? Well, in that world, in that industry, they get pretty detailed in how they describe all of that. So oftentimes you'll measure a bolt uh, or, or a screw with its length and its diameter, but then you might also look at different parts of it, like what kind of head, is it flat, is it curved, um, and so on. And if you get even more detailed into the science behind this, you'll have a lot more vocabulary to work with, such as the pitch, um, to say how, how many uh, threads per inch for a screw just to, you know, be able to know, is it going to fit in exactly where you want? Especially if you're measuring nuts and bolts and like trying to get the right fit. It's kind of like a Cinderella and her shoes sort of like that kind of, you got to get the right fit example. 
Um, and if you ever go to Home Depot to shop for screws, you'll see, you know, the way they've categorized it is there's different sizes, but then there's also different shapes, different materials, um, and all of that. There, there's a lot of uh, units of measurements that they use in order to categorize things. Uh, going back to programming, uh, we do have to be precise. And one area for that is in making calculations and uh, producing the correct output number. There is a problem called a floating point problem in a lot of programming languages. And this means that the way memory for numbers is handled, uh, sorry, the way numbers are handled in memory um, is limited to the base to uh, 0 and 1 bits. And so if you remember, like fr starting from the right, going left, you have the 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. Okay, so as you notice there, they were all even numbers, and they were all doubling of the number before it. So 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, so on. So this is how a byte in memory is stored, um, and, a, and a byte becomes a megabyte, oh no, a byte, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, and so on. Okay. So um, to really make tangible what I'm talking about here is this idea of floating point math, and this website really uh, shows really good examples of this. So if we scroll down to a language maybe that we've all seen before, Java, if we were to try and calculate point 0.1 and point 0.2, we're not going to get point 0.3 back. We're going to get point 0.3 and then this very small fraction uh, back. So this, this is a language that has a floating point problem because if you were to add 0.1 and 0.2 numerous times, it might come out to be slightly different. So an area where this might be a problem is in um, if you're like calculating somebody's paycheck and say you're the employer calculating the pay for an employee, right? You probably don't want to be giving them extra money uh, for too, too often. So then that's where you might be more concerned about choosing a language that does not have this problem. Uh, one of the ones that they've uh, really used a lot of is COBOL, but I don't see that here. I guess it doesn't really have that problem. Um, so yeah, um, you might have heard um, earlier this year that the government, the state government, uh, state governments, I should say, offices were looking for COBOL programmers because their systems for distributing the stimulus checks were written in COBOL, and their work for uh, their workforce is not as strong as it used to be in terms of the number of people because uh, most of their programmers were of the at-risk group. Um, you know, during the pandemic. But you might be wondering, like, why are they using COBOL if it's so old? Well, it's because to calculate checks for a lot of people, you want to be very precise, and COBOL is one of the languages that allow for that. Um, there are organizations uh, in, in engineering and computer science that manage a industry standard. So I wrote down here on the slide that there's two different versions from IEEE um, for the different base numbers for your uh, numbers and how that gets documented is visible here. So it's not just um, something to consider as you program and choose programming languages, but you know there's certain standards. Okay, so it's not available. There's certain standards that you have to adhere to for the industry as, um, as well. Um, and so this slide just gives a couple of examples from Java and from Python that show how 
the numbers that are calculated here will end up being this very difficult to read or to pronounce number and it's all at that website. And speaking of IEEE standards, they have a working group, a portable operating system interface POSIX group that deals with certain um, operating system type of like standards, right? So you might be wondering why you have to type certain characters um, into the command line. Well, it's because somebody, I should say some group, some committee made decisions on how things should look like. So for instance, file format notation, as you, as you recall, when you write file names, you can have like the file name and then the extension. And so that notation, they write some stuff here, character set, you know, what is the encoding for certain characters? Um, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's worth taking a look around just to see what kind of stuff has been decided. Um, and this would matter more to you if you were working on operating systems or designing things that affected that area of stuff. Um, otherwise, all you need to know is that there is a group, you know, and if you ever work on a problem that touches operating system definitions, then there is um, a place to go look for specification documents for how it's supposed to work. Um, okay, so that's the uh, first part of this lecture. Uh, and to summarize what that was, was to give you a sense of what does it mean to be specific? Why is it important to be specific? You know, what are the different kinds of documents to help express uh, communication, uh, to, to express your specific uh, conveyance of thoughts? Um, the next part of this lecture is going to be about grammars and expressing it with grammar. So we're going to go into the Bacchus now Bacchus now form, BNF notation, and then we're going to just look at a couple of small examples from different languages just to get a sense of generally what it feels like. It's, I'm, uh, I don't want to get too detailed because this is more of a like compilers class type of topic. But just to be, just for you to be aware of like how do people who work in this space document stuff would be really important. And the main advantage of knowing this is you know what the language is supposed to look like. And so when you're learning a new language, you get a better sense of what the rules are. And then if you're debugging, you know what the rules are. So you know why things are not working, why errors are happening. This is part two on the lecture about specifications. So I thought one of the key examples of specification could be for computer scientists, the grammar, like just defining not just the grammar, but the syntax of a language. Um, you might actually hear sometimes BNF being referred to as the notation for describing grammar. Um, and it's not wrong. Um, I don't actually know the differences between why it'll be uh, described as representing the grammar versus the syntax. So that's left to somebody who's a researcher in that space to be able to explain for us. But either way, uh, what I wanted to present is that there are so many different languages in this world and the way that the inventors of a language convey the thoughts and the how to use that language is through something called a BNF document. Not always, but oftentimes you'll see it. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about in this like part of the, the lecture. Um, going back to specifications, uh, if you want to use a programming language, you have to understand the grammar for that language. You have to understand how to construct statements uh, 
and, and articulate, you know, somewhat making sense through that uh, structure. So it's like knowing how to play a video game. You have to know how do you make points, um, how do you lose points, and how do you maintain enough points to keep moving on to the next level. Same thing with uh, taking courses through your undergraduate education. You're trying to figure out how to get certain grades to pass to keep moving on to the next class and eventually graduate. Similar kinds of thinking with programming where you have to think about like, how do I add different keywords and symbols together so that the computer will compile it and agree that it is valid uh, stuff. And the rules that describe all that is in a notation called BNF. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is that there's different versions of BNF. There's extended BNF and then there's the original BNF. So I'm just going to go with the older version because we're going to start with the Algo 60 example and that's where it first came from. So that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, there's, you know, some, some people are going to get more technical about if you should use BNF or eBNF. Either way, they're both talking about context-free grammars, and I think for the purposes of uh, this class, if you refer to it as BNF, most people will be able to understand what you're talking about, right? Just like if we go back to the first part, the um, slide saying there's two groups of people who talk about color, you know, it's you could say blue or you can say teal, um, but it comes down to, for the purposes of this talk, uh, we're describing, uh, we're, we're looking at the documents that describe the uh, syntax of a language. Um, to help you be able to see how a BNF notation works, I wanted to introduce this tree uh, that depicts a math formula. So we have 4 minus and then in parentheses 3 plus 2. If you remember in your math classes, there's this PEMDAS rule that says parentheses, then um, exponents, then multiplication, um, and so on. So there is an order of precedence for how the rule should work. And by reading through that, we can see that the subtree 3 plus 2 should be calculated prior to 4 minus that number. And if you don't follow the right order of things, you're going to get the wrong result. So you see how there are certain rules that you need to just kind of be able to know as you work through reading something. Um, so that rule that you're reading through this is the same thing as what a machine is going to be looking at when you write code and then you compile it. The machine is going to try to work through all these different rules and process through and if your use of the rules matches what they understand then your code compiles and that's what gets you a working program. Working program in the sense that it is uh, it is compilable. I'm not talking about getting the right business logic because that is a whole other ball game. All right? In a piece of software you have two different rules. You have the business problem that you're working on, but you also have the actual software uh, programming source code compiling. So there's distinct there's distinct goals to any sort of programming activity. All right, moving on. So BNF is a specific formal notation. It was introduced with the ALGO 60 report. So in 1958, 1960, Bacchus and now I think those are two different people. Uh, they came up with this format to describe the ALGO language. The significance of the ALGO language was that it's the first one to have the ability to nest code. So you have the lexical scope, which means you can nest things. You can have the if statement, you could have a for loop, and you can have code that only operates um, in that little loop um, in terms of like variable definitions. 
that don't correspond with anything outside of it. So you can have slightly more advanced programming than before, which was just procedural um, stuff that just, you know, sequentially ran through stuff and you couldn't branch logic and manage um, or conditions. Anyway, going back to BNF. So that was like the first report that was uh, where it was created. So that's what, 80 years ago. Um, and to this day, 80 years later, we still have a lot of researchers in the programming language space who, uh, I should say programming and compilers. And they, they will use this notation still and maybe like variations and more modern variations such as ebnf but they're going to use some some form that's very similar to this you're also going to get people who invent new programming language um, to try and create some sort of reference material that contains similar syntactical rule definitions because it's a very condensed way of presenting information and it's just like so concise and inarguably like you know something where like the person writing it sees it a certain way and the person reading it sees it a certain way um, so every rule follows a certain structure so on the left you have the name and then on the right the expansion so the expansion part is where you can have a lot of different things um, different uh, additional possibilities that they might call like terms um, or expressions They've got different names for it, but it basically says it's kind of like a tree where you've got a parent node and then you've got children node. And anytime you see the pipe symbol, it means you could have either children on the left or right. And if it's the green looking thing with the angle brackets, then that usually means that you can treat that as a parent and it's got its own children nodes that can continuously like be nested. So that's actually one of the main benefits for why people use BNF to describe a language because this way they can document what are the possible structures available in working with the code. Alright, so now if you know that you have to put in your mathematical equations, you have to put the operands in between, no, sorry, the operands on either side of an operator, you know, like infix position, that's one way, you know, that you've seen it. Now, um, if it's prefix or not, prefix, infix, the language will be defined through this notation. So you can see now, like, it, it's, it's a pretty useful way to describe languages. So I just got a couple more examples listed here. The first is to show that you can have your uh, your mailing address described as a BNF. And so part of that is you can have a street address and as you remember if you're writing mail uh, to somebody you have your house number followed by the street name then followed by the apartment number. You don't you know, get the order in a different way, you have to put in that order and that's why it's expressed in that order without the pipes. Another example are alphabetical characters. So you can have uppercase or lowercase. And if you want to just say, here's an alpha character, now you have all these different pipes to show that you can have any of these. It doesn't have to be all. It doesn't have to be just uppercase. It could be either upper or lowercase. Um, and because these symbols um, on the bottom part do not have angle brackets, it's considered terminal, meaning you can't replace that with something else. It means that's a literal, like, it will be one of these characters. So now that you have an idea of the basic building blocks for a BNF notation, what could be expressed by BNF? The simple answer is that you can describe the different parts of a pro programming language, meaning the different abstractions that a programming language can handle. So defining the primitives, defining variable names, how the variable names can look like in terms of naming, naming uh, rules, uh, the expressions for writing different statements or writing functions, classes, Etc. and so on. So there's just all these different things where you can write 
a rule in BNF notation. So the first example we're going to look at here is Java, since you might be familiar with it. The uh, documentation for the Java language contains a BNF notation, and I linked it here in case you're interested in looking it up. And I pulled from that document two examples. One is the if statement that you definitely have worked with before, and a for statement. So as you can see, you can have uh, for if statement, an if followed by the expression and then the statement. So in your Java uh, programming classes, this is basically the structure that you're learning to code with and think about. I don't know why they don't really just tell you, like, you have to do it this way because this is what the inventor designed in terms of this is what you have to be able to do. but. Regardless, uh, this this is what boils down to like why you have to write it that way, because that's what the inventor said you have to do. Uh, for a for statement, you have two different variations. You can have uh, three parts to it. So you have like the thing to initialize the um, the index variable, and then you have an expression to check for is it still valid? Should you continue the loop? And then how to update that index variable. So um, again, you could see there's different parts to the logic that's expressed that you would just you would just fill in in the right appropriate places. Uh, here's an example of writing a class and then a main method within a main class. Um, so you probably can write this from memory because, you know, possibly you've written it so many different times and like you, you've got that locked into your brain, like the structure of where things should go. Well, um, these rules are defined, again, through that documentation and that link that's linked there. So you can have a class declaration, which has a modifier, and if you remember, access modifier is things like public, private, um, default, and so on. And you have the keyword class in there. So now you have public and you have class. And then you have an identifier, which means the variable name or the class name. Um, if you want to be specific, the class name is given here. So that would be the main word there. And then type parameters would uh, be followed. Um, and that would be for if you work with interfaces and other like object-oriented principles that the Java language allows. Now, the square bracket means it's optional, so that's why it's not pictured there. Then you have the curly brace. So remember, you have to write the curly brace to start that method. Sorry, the, the you have to start that class with that. And then within there, you can have different kinds of declarations in the body. So I think the documentation said something like you can have variable names dis defined, you could have uh, methods defined. So I pulled the definition for method declaration out here just to put it on the slide and make it easy to look at. And here you have the method modifier for the um, access permissions again. So you have public and then you have the header itself, and there's a bunch of different rules there. But you can also see that it also starts with the curly brace and ends with the curly brace, and then you've got the statements within there. So it follows that pattern. So when you're programming, you're adhering to a set of rules that the compiler is also adhering to. So now you can see, right, like, just like when you're buying shoes, the manufacturers uh, produce to a certain thing, and you as a customer have to produce a certain thing and a retailer has to ensure that when they are selling that they've got the right size and they ship out the right size for the consumer who's chosen the right size. So rules are specifications. Or I should say BNF notation are the rules and the rules are the specification. Yeah. Okay, next example. So we've uh, looked at awk a little bit in this class already. And I just thought maybe I'd just bring it in just so, you know, we could look at it formally. 
This is a tool that came out, um, you know, almost, I guess, 50 to 80 years ago as well, um, in the 70s. So, uh, 50 to 60, I guess, would be the right number. Um, so we have here Print Hello World because uh, I'm just continuing with that idea of how do you print out Hello World. Um, in Java, remember we had the class and then we had the method. That is how the Java land requires statements to be written. In awk, there's no classes to keep track of. There's no objects. It's not an object oriented language, but you can still print hello world and it's something as simple as this. All the other stuff on this slide um, is demonstrating to you how a awk program reads through a file input. I didn't specify a file input, but if you're looking at, say for instance, on the homework assignment, uh, movies.csv, then what would happen is you include that as part of your awk command, and then the awk program will start looking through the beginning, or I, I should say it would have a begin like, um, type of before you start reading the file actions that are defined and then you start reading and with each line you have a pattern that could uh, de describe you know should you look at only certain things uh, and then the action for that line if if it does get filtered by that pattern so that all program keeps running through the whole file until the very end which then you can do something like print, I'm done processing the file, which would then be like happening only at the very end after the file is read. If you open up the manual for awk, you're going to be able to see a section called grammars. And the authors did write and package in their manual page a section on the valid uh, syntax for writing an awk program. So I pulled a couple examples here. Uh, you could write a print statement, which would then like start with the word print. And that would be part of this action block that would start with the curly brace and end with the curly brace. And there are other rules that I removed from this excerpt because that would have been confusing. So, um, you know, this, this shows that there are grammars in the manual that correlate with how you can use it. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that because this program came out in the 70s, we're probably not going to be able to get a chance to chat with the original developers or even like a core set of developers who like use this every single day, right? So then we're kind of depending on the manual and the grammar's rules to be able to figure out how to use it. Um, and that's a nice tie-in to where BNF started from, which is with Algo 60. This programming language was known as like the first one that was described with BNF officially, and it was published in the communications of the ACM. This is the official organization for the computer science industry. And so this BNF was invented in the 1950s or maybe it was Algol 60 that was invented in the 1950s and then it was published again and then again. And so most people refer to the 1961, but sometimes, you know, one might be referring to 1958 or even like the 1962, I think, version. But usually the most like common reference would be the 1960 report published in the year 1960. The uh, importance of the Algol 60 language is that it's the first one to have nested functions defined. And that means that uh, you could nest blocks of code within each other and branch out logic, which means you could skip over certain logic if it's unnecessary, right? So it's kind of like when you have the filtering principles with awk, you can do that. Um, and uh, it, it did come before awk, so you know awk borrowed some of those ideas to have the begin and the end delimiters.
because algol 60 has been around long enough you know people had time to start drawing out how the syntax works so the report itself um, in the pdf form linked has um, the syntax written in text form but there's also graphical forms of that syntax um, just to give you an example of what the code looks like, you have the begin and the end statement to signify the start and the end of the code. Comments start with the word comment. And then you can have uh, variables defined with the type. And you could define a for loop, you know, from 1 until 5. You could print out hello world um, and so on. So then you just continue incrementing um, to end that loop. So this would print out hello world five times, I guess. Um, next example, scheme. So there's a lot of different dialects of scheme. Um, the one that I usually refer to will either be Racket or Guile, which is produced by GNU. Um, in in this class we're probably just going to go with like the generic constructs of scheme like the ideas and like the features of the language that is implemented by all like most of the variations we're going to probably going to stick with the basic stuff so don't worry like we're not going to get so specific that um you have to memorize an encyclopedia of knowledge let's start with the hello world and scheme um the first line here with the semicolon is a comment. One semicolon signifies a comment, and that would have been fine. But I wanted to make it really clear that it is a comment. So I added multiple semicolons for aesthetic flair. In order to print hello world, it's very much like awk, where you just say display or print, you know, the, the action to produce on the console and then the string following that action that's needed. So the scheme BNF would say you have an expression and that expression can contain any of these things and um, the display I think is a procedural call uh, or a macro I can't remember exactly but um, Point being, there's also BNF with scheme. Moving on to JavaScript, because we're going to cover JavaScript a little bit briefly in this class as well. Um, the main points I wanted to talk about right now, because we will go into JavaScript a little bit more later, just like we'll go into scheme a little bit more later, is that the official name for JavaScript is ECMA um, and it stands for it's an acronym that stands for something um, It stands for European Computer Manufacturers Association. Um, that's not too important right now, but it is an acronym. Um, so ECMA specifications is the official name, and I should have linked to the, the exact document there. So let me go and do that right now. That's the official name of the documentation. So you can probably look for it online through uh, say, I don't know, JavaScript um, grammar, JavaScript specification, JavaScript BNF, and so on. Um, you're going to see here lexical grammar, tokens, names, and so on. So you'll see, like, that's how they've described here the uh, BNF notation. But you're also going to see sometimes, and especially in the JavaScript The Good Parts book, 
is the railroad diagrams and that's the name for this kind of graphical de depiction that shows how um, the grammar looks like in a graphical form and for some people it's easier to follow this because then they could just look through and see like well there is a line so that can be the next thing and if I have a variable name then I don't want to do the expression right away but instead if variable name in expression and so you could probably look for the uh, corresponding for loop uh, definition uh, one more way that you might be able to see your programming language documented, and this is a little less formal, um, and this is a little bit more of trying to define relationships between different business logic concepts using your code. So you can write type signatures or type definitions, which isn't so much the grammar for what a machine might be able to compile and understand, but a little bit more towards for the um, the programmer to be able to get a sense of the business logic concept. So for instance, if it's a company selling fruit as their products, you can organize a set of types under um, fruit, citrus, citrus or melons, and then within citrus you can have um, you know, oranges, lemons, uh, limes and then under melon you can have watermelon versus uh, honeydew and whatever so on so like that's another way to be able to describe what is possible but not necessarily in terms of syntax but more in terms of the business logic this video linked here um, is by Chris Jenkins and he goes in a little bit more to describe how uh, you can do that with programming languages and just to end this uh, lecture before going on to the next one about programming languages, uh, you should know that you should look up the um, documentation for things. It's very essential to not only read what's there, but if you can add to it. So if you write any programs, you write your own documentation and know that there's um, for every project, uh, not every project has a documentation available, so if you want to contribute, you can definitely do so. The documentation is typically left up to the developer to produce because they are the ones understanding the technical information. And so because usually programmers are interested in writing source code as opposed to human language co uh, content, that's why sometimes you'll see a project doesn't have enough documentation because it's due to that. And then when it is there, when there is documentation, sometimes it's outdated because it doesn't keep up to pace with the source code or it might be poorly written or hard to find, etc. So this is kind of like the reason why in school we keep emphasizing you should write comments to your code and you should document your code and write documentation and all this other stuff it's not to be boring and pedantic. It's because there are really good outcomes from being able to get your end user or if you hand off your project to someone else, it's really good that they can be able to know how to work with the thing that you've created. And for that, there is an example. Um, I did provide an example. If you look in your learning modules, there is a link to a uh, a document with commenting examples and it's just uh, examples written to show like how you can describe what the program that you've written is supposed to work on how it works on it and how to do the types uh, uh, what what are the expected types to input in and what's going to be the expectation coming back from that function so all these comments describe how that program works um, and then for the next lecture, we're going to go into programming paradigms. So it's going to cover the fact that there's a lot of programming languages that exist and a lot of new programming languages, uh, a lot of programming languages that have been invented since ALGOL 60. And in fact, this summer, there is a hackathon with a $10,000 prize 
for folks to create a new language. If you go to this link, they will describe how to apply and compete in this hackathon. This is by a company called Ruffle.it. Ruffle.it, they put, published on their blog this hackathon to generate interest for creating a new language that they could have on their website to support uh, learning new languages. And there's just a lot of research in the programming world. There's even um, a workshop coming up for students later this summer as well. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanna leave with is that all these programming languages, there's so many out there. One of the ways to classify them and one of the most common ways to classify them is to talk about different paradigms. So we're gonna cover this in the le next lecture to describe a little bit like what are the main paradigms available and um, you know what makes them different from each other. So to summarize this lecture, it's really important to be specific and there's different ways to measure uh, specific specificity. And then what we looked at is how the uh, we looked at how the syntax for programming languages can be made specific and documented. And um, that is now our transition point to programming languages next.